um, that aspect of, uh, of actually pushing the gas with a remote team. Um, next, identifying the market and actually designing how do you think about the structure of the team across different offices, different geographies. And lastly, some of our key learnings that we've, uh, that we've seen by working with many different companies um, uh, throughout our time, both at Terminal and uh, prior experiences. So very quickly, a little about me. I'm one of the founders of, of Terminal. Um, I got my first real taste of building remote teams when I was at Eventbrite, my last company, for seven years. Um, Eventbrite, uh, when I joined, was all co-located in one office at the time I left. Uh, there were multiple development centers spread across uh, three different countries, uh, excuse me, three different continents, five different countries. Um, so really saw how a team can go from one center of excellence to becoming a global company um, and the benefits of being able to tap into different geographies. Uh, a little about Terminal, we were founded in 2016 and we're headquartered in San Francisco, although we have five campuses spread across Canada as well as uh, our newest campus opening in Mexico. To date, we have helped over 20 companies build remote teams using our strategy and use our service. We've helped them hire over 160 what we call members. Um, these are engineers as part of their development team. Uh, we're privileged to have uh, the backing of such uh, venture capital firms such as Kleiner Perkins, Lightspeed, Teal Capital, Craft Ventures, and Atomic. Just to give you a sense of kind of the experience that we've had with those companies. So we've helped companies like Eventbrite, like Hims, which we'll talk to today, Dialpad, uh, Zenreach, all of these companies build and develop their remote team strategy. Um, as you can see, remote teams is not unique to one specific vertical. We have enterprise SaaS companies, marketplaces, direct-to-consumer, um, FinTech, as well as real estate, um, really spread across. And I think the commonality that all these companies share is really the insatiable demand for strong technical talent. And why is that? Um, the reason why we exist and the reason why we are excited to build Terminal is that we believe the biggest problem facing growing technology companies is access to talent. Um, while capital, I think if you look back over the last few years, capital has poured into the venture capital industry, allowing many more companies to grow at unprecedented rates, but access to talent continues to be one of the most constraining factors that founders cite as inhibiting their growth. Um, and if we look at the data, it suggests this case. So there's five job openings for every one developer in the US. 24% attrition rate at US technology companies. So if we think about that, um, not only is it challenging to actually hire someone because you're competing with four other companies for that one developer, but actually having to retrain or rehire your staff uh, every four years, just even to keep up with attrition is challenging, let alone hiring ahead to accelerate your growth. And it's estimated that by 2020, there'll be over 1.5 million unfilled software developer jobs. So we look at this problem um, primarily from a US-centric point of view, but as you pan out, um, truly talent is global. Um, Silicon Valley, New York, well, major tech hubs, they do not have a monopoly on smart, ambitious people. Talent is global. And if we look at the software developer market overall, um, almost 85% of that talent is outside the US, is international. Um, if we look at what are the leading coding schools actually nurturing and developing that talent, 17 out of 20 are outside the US. Um, and if we look back kind of at the history of Silicon Valley in particular, we've had this habit of creating strong companies, but then assuming that we can actually pull in the STEM workers required to, to support the demand that we've had. Um, so a third of STEM workers in New York, for example, are immigrants. Um, and those are, uh, and a lot of immigrants rely on H-1Bs or other visas in order to have um, an approved status to work at these companies. Now, what we've seen is H-1B uncertainty over the last two years has been a 40% increase in denial. So one, if the talent is international and that's where the schools are developing the talent and we can't get the talent into these existing hubs, what do you do? The real challenge uh, becomes 
how do you actually uh, how do you actually take your uh, take your company and bring it to the talent? And that's what we want to chat through today. Um, as you look at how companies are approaching this uh, this challenge, there are three major choices that tend to uh, uh, tend to surface as the options. Um, the first is if you're facing hiring challenges in your current market the number one thing people do is double down in-house. So invest more in terms of recruiters, tech, uh, ta uh, talent tech, um, basically beefing up the recruiting team. Um, the other is saying, okay, if we're unable to compete, maybe we need to increase our compensation to compete with some larger companies that are taking our pipeline, or we need to actually reduce our requirements to allow more junior candidates to be considered. And the last option is outsource the problem. So throw your arms up and say, look, we can't deal with this. Let's find some consultancy that already has the developers on staff to, uh, to work with us. Now, real briefly, doubling down in-house, it might work um, if there was enough talent in the existing ecosystem. But as we looked at, there's a supply and demand imbalance in most of the major tech hubs. So doubling down um, isn't actually gonna increase the addressable market that you can serve. Uh, refactoring requisitions, that is a challenge. Either you're financially constrained by actually following um, large compensation packages that might be outside of where you are as a company and can afford, and junior candidates could slow the pace and especially drain resources if you need to kind of nurture and develop that talent. Um, outsourcing, as we'll go through, um, the traditional market, there's a lot of questions on, on overall quality and delivery. So. None of these options we, we feel confident about. And for that reason, you know, we wanted to develop Terminal. Um, the idea being that we could have focused expertise in building remote teams by focusing truly on the infrastructure and services required to make them successful, to build, manage, and ultimately scale those teams. On the client side, we want our, our partners to focus really on the core aspects of building their business, managing the team, and making the hiring decisions to grow their company. On the developer side, engineers want to work on great products. They want to be part of a high-growth startup community. And Terminal is really that connecting bridge to allow it to happen. Give you a sense of where we operate today. Um, we are operating mostly in North America. So we have a campus in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Waterloo, and Guadalajara that I mentioned is opening soon. We pick these markets for a variety of reasons, but overall, as you can see, these markets alone actually provide reach to three times the amount of uh, tech talent that exists in the Bay Area. Um, so while independently they are all um, uh, smaller markets, together it is a really strong global reach. Not only that, there's advantages to each of these markets. From Vancouver, thinking about time zone alignment and average salary, to Montreal, thinking about actually having a very large student population um, that has been an accelerator to that ecosystem. Toronto and Waterloo being very centric around certain computer science um, uh, programs at universities that are really strong. Um, Guadalajara, very similar qualities and a tremendous kind of opportunity for companies that are looking to build in a, in a very greenfield market. As we look at kind of the Canadian talent in particular, where we've had a lot of success, um, it is, uh, it is super competitive with what we actually see in the Bay Area. Um, while you might not see the Stanford or Caltech as the universities, the university system in Canada is very strong, particularly around the computer science programs. University of Waterloo, UBC, University of Toronto, all ranked in the top 50 for computer science globally. Not only that, we also see that this talent, while living in Canada, has had exposure to some of the most premier tech brands like Apple, Google, Slack, EA, um, Shopify, the homegrown Canadian company that has produced a tremendous amount of talent and also helped to keep that talent in Canada. Um, so as we look at kind of the, the members of Terminal, most of them are very senior engineers, and most of them um, not only have a bachelor's degree, but over 40% actually have a master's or PhD. So if you look at it kind of from a US point of view, is not junior talent. This is actually very senior talent that are coming in to our, our client teams. 
that's a little bit of a kind of background, at least to set the stage of us, our experience, and, and where we're operating from in terms of our, our point of view. Now I'll talk a little bit about remote as the path forward. I think the interesting thing since starting the company um, is that uh, the conversation is no longer, do you think you'll build a remote team in the future? The question is not if, it really is now when. Um, and I think there's a preponderance of, of uh, belief across investors and founders that every great company will be a remote company. It is a matter of at what stage do you invest in that to accelerate the growth? Um, and the timing of that is, is in particular very interesting to consider. So when is the right time? Um, I would say the overall learning we've had is it is never, uh, you never want to be too late to build a remote team. Um, so the right timing tends to happen when you know that you're going to need extra capacity and build to that. The challenge, I think, in, in waiting too long is that you build a huge gap in terms of your, uh, your product roadmap. So if you can't ship product, if you can't bring it to market, you're not going to be able to fund your company off revenue. If you can't fund off revenue, it's going to be hard to get investment. It's going to be hard to get investment if you, don't, if you haven't proven that you can actually build a team to sustain your product. So it's kind of this, this uh, roundabout loop that makes it very challenging. The other case that we often see is when a company has basically has held the belief that they could build their team in a standalone market um, for a significant period of time. Maybe they get up to 50, 60, 80 engineers, all co-located. Um, what we tend to see is a market shift happens. New startups are created that really balloon within that ecosystem, and that company is no longer able to hire. Not only are they no longer able to hire effectively, attrition rates tend to go up in that case, but also they have no idea how to actually build a remote team because their culture, their practices, their systems, their organizational structure has all been built around the idea of co-location. So what we're starting to see now is companies building that much earlier into life cycle. And we'll go through a case study where we actually saw one of the fastest growing companies in the world right now built that into their blueprint from day one, and it has proven to be a very successful strategy. So right timing, I would say, is to at least start thinking about it is, is yesterday, um, and tomorrow is probably a good time to start building in the practices that will help set you on a path to be a successful company in, in a remote structure. One of the most important considerations as you start to think about building the remote team is going to be identifying the proper market. Most companies that, uh, that we speak with um, look at at least these five criteria. Um, at Terminal, when we're analyzing where we want to expand our, our market, we actually looked um, across more than 70 different data points to evaluate the markets um, and then different weighting models in terms of how you value each of the, uh, the different criteria. Um, one of the first things that uh, you'll need to consider is time zone. Um, time zone alignment is, uh, is probably one of the biggest things as we talk to CTOs that they're, they're cognizant of. In some cases, you want to align time zones so that there's perfect overlap uh, with your headquarters office. You think about San Francisco and Vancouver, sharing the Pacific time zone is very strong. Other times, you can strategically think about extending the workday by having time zones that are actually a couple hours apart. So uh, East Coast starts work a little bit earlier, and then your Pacific office um, picks that up a few hours behind. You still have strong amount of overlap, but you're extending the workday by having um, those offset a little bit. Um, we do hear that one of the most challenging things to do is when time zones are completely flipped, um, most of the time that's San Francisco to parts of Eastern Asia, um, becomes very difficult to have any time to communicate around product development or those types of casual conversations that can lead to um, sparks of innovation. Um, so time zone, very important. For that reason, as you can see with Terminal, we've, we very much look north and south rather than east and west. Proximity to headquarters is also a big consideration. Um, we look at this as um, how easy is it for you to travel? Um, one of the things that we'll talk about in a little bit um, is around the value of face-to-face, -face, even in a remote environment. Um, but proximity to headquarters is important to kind of think through in terms of both uh, travel um, and the ability for uh, perhaps the teams to 
uh, go both ways, not only proximity for that team to go to headquarters, but headquarters to go to your remote office. Another thing that we consider is looking at what is the long-term plan for this market? How do we think this market is going to develop? And a lot of that is what are the feeders into that talent ecosystem? Oftentimes, it's going to be universities, computer science programs. Other times, it's going to be incumbent companies that have trained that workforce. So actually, you know, for us, we've actually seen a very positive effect of having a terminal campus right near a Google campus. People will go to Google potentially for three or four years, get very much trained up, um, get a really strong base of skill sets, and then want to work at a much smaller startup. And we benefit from actually being close by in, in those cases. Last thing to consider, uh, excuse me, uh, penultimate thing to consider is cost of living. Um, generally, as you're looking at investing in a new market, you are going to be either working with a partner or investing in new infrastructure. And a benefit that you can get getting outside the U.S. is going to be a lower cost of living, which translates into lower salaries. Um, it is an advantage that we see some companies trying to optimize, I would say, too much for, um, and you optimize too much on kind of the cost arbitrage and don't think about some of the other factors. Um, but it is a, an, uh, an important aspect to understand, especially as you're planning your budget. Um, and then the last thing is English proficiency. So if you are uh, a predominantly English-speaking company, um, making sure that you're doing the research in the market um, to ensure that there's going to be enough talent that can communicate kind of effectively, especially when you're in a remote environment, and that matters so much more. We've seen some strategies to offset the challenges if English isn't super strong, such as having translators in the office or having both um, headquarters learn Spanish at the same time you're teaching English for example, um, if you're in a South American market. Um, those are five of, I think, the most important factors, though, when you're considering uh, market selection. So now I want to quickly touch on a case study. Um, one of our partners uh, that we've been working with really since the beginning, since their inception, um, has now been renowned as one of the fastest growing direct-to-consumer companies of all time. In less than a year, they went from virtually no valuation to a billion dollars in their latest round of, of funding, um, which is incredible and astronomical growth, both as a team, as a company, and in terms of their brand and their customers. And this company um, is called HIMS. They are a direct-to-consumer company that is making access to healthcare easier for men and women. Um, that includes a variety of different products from, uh, from hair loss, um, to, uh, to ED medication, um, and I, I believe they're constantly actually adding new, uh, new products to their line. But overall, they knew that they had a massive market opportunity, um, kind of the confluence of telemedicine laws um, becoming um, more open for many states, as well as many of uh, what had been previously patented drugs becoming now um, generics. Uh, those two factors, they realized there's a massive opportunity to kind of blend those into a new form of, of health care for the millennial generation. Um, the question wasn't on the market opportunity. The big question in their mind was, how are we going to actually scale this faster than our competition so that we can become the market leader? Luckily, their CEO, Andrew, um, was familiar with both Terminal as well as um, the idea of managing remote teams. At his last company, he had managed a remote team, and that experience showed him, I think, both the, uh, the flexibility that you have when you're building teams across multiple markets, as well as the speed. So HIMS ended up building their company, um, starting with their first engineering hire, all through Terminal. So Terminal is really the platform for supporting the growth of their teams. Now, I think the strategy that they used was really interesting. Up front, Andrew decided that I will make the trade-off of convenience for speed. So it would be very convenient for everyone to be in the same office, but that's going to force us to have much slower pipeline of, of talent and a recruiting process. So Andrew wanted to optimize for speed. And in doing that, he decided to build his team across multiple terminals, benefiting from actual clustering of different talent in those different markets. In particular, he first built the web development team in the Waterloo campus of Terminal, knowing that over time, he'd be able to leverage 
some of the benefits and proximity of the University of Waterloo to benefit his team to be able to grow and prosper um, in that market. Second, he had to build a data science team. Montreal is known for having some of the strongest data science and machine learning uh, programs and engineers in the market. And it's also been kind of an attraction point. Not only are they grooming the best, um, a lot of people are moving to that market because it's known as that hub. So a data science team was established through Terminal Montreal. And lastly, Vancouver has traditionally been known as a really strong design-centric City. A lot of design firms and consultancies have come out of that market, and he decided to build their front end and design team um, in Vancouver. So not only was he able to find very strong specialists that are clustered around these markets, he had the access of three different campuses, three different geographies and talent pools to accelerate their growth. Oftentimes, companies at his size would have one market. The fact that he's leveraging three markets enabled him to build a team of over 20 um, in a three-month period, um, which is well over the market average and really propelled them into a position of, uh, of growth much earlier than um, most companies at his stage. So a pretty interesting model, but there's definitely a thought, um, that a lot of thought that went into it that on day one, they were going to be a remote company. They were going to have a preference for speed and quality over convenience, and they were going to build their talent roadmap um, uh, with that in mind from day one. So thinking about it very intentionally versus reactively, that he didn't get stuck by the build a remote strategy. This was a very thoughtful approach from day one. If you want to go remote, what do you need to know now? So I think the way in which I think to, to kind of provide, I think, some of the best advice here is really thinking about some of the pitfalls that we commonly see people make on their path to building a remote team. The first one is hiring managers with limited experience. So I think one of the most common things that we're seeing now um, is to hire for that future state of having a remote team. And the best way of being able to set yourself up for success is hiring managers today that have that experience. So when you say to them, hey, we're going to build a remote team to augment your current responsibilities, having someone with that experience is super important. If you can hire for it today, even if you're going to use it tomorrow, better for you. Um, it's very hard to have someone who's learning on the job, especially for more junior managers, to learn how to effectively communicate, manage um, with a remote team if they're learning on the job. Second is underestimating the level of overhead needed to go remote. So I went through this when I was at Eventbrite in a front row seat to us building our first remote team in Argentina. Um, the challenge actually was not access to talent once we got down there. The challenge is really figuring out how to open up an entity, working with the government to get approvals, leasing office space, growing out of that office, moving to a new office, trying to drop fiber internet to support that office, hiring support staff to manage the office, janitor security, figuring out payroll taxes, government taxes, benefits, all of the complexity that goes into supporting the team, all of that we didn't understand. And understanding kind of the level of overhead that goes into support a remote team is extremely important. Three is thinking that virtual communication is enough. So just because we do have and we are blessed in this age of uh, hyper connectivity with Slack, with Zoom, with different conferencing uh, equipment and materials, um, that's not enough. The, the biggest pitfall, uh, one of the biggest pitfalls we see is not investing um, and planning a budget around travel to be there face to face with your team. Um, that has to be forced into kind of the operating model when you onboard someone, when is the first time they're going to be face-to-face -face with your team, and then what is the cadence for going back and forth? Do you go to the remote office? Do the remote employees come to headquarters? Building that in and keeping that consistent is extremely important. When you're interviewing remote folks, one of the, I think it's very common to think, let me interview them the same way that I would if I was face-to-face. -face. Um, but we see some of the best strategies actually to interview someone potentially um, and incorporate written communication more, right? If they're remote, they're going to rely on messages, emails as ways of communicating. Um, and if you're just speaking to someone, it's hard to know how they communicate with, uh, with written. Um, so 
thinking about what is going to be their natural state of their environment for work and what are the skills that might be different than if I was working with this person right next to me and how do I actually judge whether they're going to be effective in that way for me and my team. Fifth pitfall is going to be operating with full understanding of competitive local markets comp demands. So um, understanding the local ecosystem is extremely important. We've had uh, we've heard, I would say, uh, horror stories of companies that decide to build a remote team in the market without ever visiting the market, without actually getting to know who are going to be the competitors that I'm going to have to steal talent from. And can I actually compete with them in order to succeed in the market? What are the actual comp demands that are going to, uh, that I'm going to have to face when speaking with candidates? How do I be knowledgeable about uh, those factors when, um, when having those uh, negotiations with candidates? Now, last, thinking that the, quote, Silicon Valley way will resonate with everyone. Um, one of the biggest learnings of, of working, particularly in Canada, is that um, you can actually turn off candidates by pushing too hard too fast. So I think it's very common in, in the Valley that people want to move quickly. There's a lot of movement in terms of the liquidity of the talent across different companies. When you put an offer out there, maybe you give 24 hours for that offer to expire. You sometimes will get an offer after interviewing for an hour because they know they want you and want to push. That will not resonate in all markets. In some cases, actually being slow and deliberate is going to be what builds trust with the candidate. If you move too quickly, they might actually question, why, why is this company trying to move this quickly? If they're moving this quickly to hire me, are they going to move this quickly to fire me? Um, a lot of those considerations need to be understood as far as how that will resonate with the culture in that local market. Now, there's different ways that we see companies actually structuring their teams for success um, in a remote environment. I'll go through a few different examples. Probably the most common that we see, especially upfront, is uh, augmentation, so staff augmentation. Basically, we have current gaps in our team. We will use a remote team to plug those holes and allow our core team to move faster. I think the benefit that you get is this is going to be speedy. If you just look plug existing gaps, um, that will tend to be mid-level or junior, even engineers. Um, and that's going to be really fast just to add an additional front end or, or full stack engineer to an existing team. The challenge, though, is typically those uh, individuals, those resources will report into headquarters. Um, putting a bit of, uh, of strain on whoever's managing that team. Um, they're going to have to ensure that they are bridging the right knowledge um, and any gaps with those individuals who are in the remote office. Um, also, uh, in terms of a long-term plan, um, if those individuals always feel like they're plugging gaps for headquarters, you're really creating kind of a division between the remote team and the headquarters team. Um, this is good, I would say, for short term, and short term meaning you know, six months, maybe a year. Um, overall, what is the plan to actually get that team to be a standalone functioning squad? Um, and that will take uh, long term planning. The other common structure we see is hiring a lead, um, someone who actually will lead the team, and then building a team around that individual. Um, this is definitely an easier structure to manage. Um, the idea being that if you hire a really strong lead who has people management skills, it will offset a lot of the burden from a director of engineering, let's say at headquarters, from having to manage a lot of the day-to-day -day that goes into supporting that group. It is a slower process because hiring a lead usually will be a more senior hire. It will take more resources to find that person to recruit them. Um, so it is, is slow. And the other common uh, thing that we see that uh, I would put as a, a negative, but more as a caution, is that if you believe that lead is going to be the right foundational leader for that group, you might fall back and rely too much on that person and think, hey, face-to-face -face doesn't matter with that team because we have the lead in place and they'll manage a lot of, um, a lot of the, uh, the um, they'll be the first line of defense. Um, and leaning too much there can definitely be a negative. Finally, there's the standalone pod structure. Um, oftentimes, this doesn't come into play unless you're actually acquiring um, unless you're actually acquiring a team. Um, building this will take a long time, but the idea is that um, eventually you get to a standalone pod where you have 
all the resources necessary to actually own a product end to end. Um, this is typically where I think most companies want to get to um, because you can plan a roadmap and decide we're going to give this, uh, this team over here, complete ownership of, of this end to end to bring it to delivery. Um, that becomes very much a benefit in terms of versatility that you don't have to think about um, which product to give them because they can actually own everything end to end. Um, generally, a lead is still required. So having someone who is the de facto leader of that pod driving the direction and the accountability is required. So it still takes time to form. Um, and then also making sure that um, just because you have a standalone pod that's remote, that you're not giving them less important tasks or projects. Um, I think one of the most important things to do once you have that pod in place is actually give them something of high importance. Um, typically, we'll see a lot of those teams step up, outperform headquarters because they do want to show that they can handle that. Um, it's almost that chip on the shoulder that they want to prove to the headquarters team that, hey, we're here, we're just as strong as, uh, as you, and we can handle some of the most important projects at the company. Um, so definitely encourage companies to give actually some of their most important um, jobs and roles to that team, allow them to be successful, and make sure that then that turns everyone into a, really a first-class employee. The team, the standalone pod structure, if not built on day one, um, can be evolved into, meaning that you could start with team augmentation, plug the gaps, have that team learn your code base, then find a team lead, have that lead really shape kind of the independent trajectory of that group, and also build in a standalone pod. So add the additional resources that make that group able to own something end to end. A couple key takeaways that I think just to, to highlight again is one, being able to actually build into a leadership structure and building and hiring for leaders that can manage remote as well. Um, investing in travel, um, oftentimes the best companies when they're hiring someone, they're immediately setting a travel budget um, to ensure that they've partitioned off the enough funds to go face to face with those individuals, whether that's bringing them to HQ for onboarding or having a quarterly um, uh, week long retreat with everyone. And lastly, really be thoughtful around the communication, not just selecting, you know, a good stack of, of remote communication tools, um, but then thinking creatively about the ways that those actually operate. Um, one of the uh, interesting, you know, kind of point of conversation is thinking you have six people who are in headquarters and one person that's remote, um, you know, their head is usually broadcast on a TV that's 72 inches. Um, the best companies I see put everyone into um, the video meeting, whether they're remote or not, so that everyone is essentially looking at the same experience. So being thoughtful and, and, as an, as that kind of one example of, of how you build that into um, your culture for, for managing those teams. One of the best ways of actually testing whether you're ready for that or not is have a group of your best engineers work from home for a week or two weeks. Test that out, have them record what was challenging, what was difficult, what made them feel isolated, um, and then incorporate that into your playbook for ensuring that you're ready and set up uh, uh, to go um, before you build that team. And the last, uh, the last slide of, of my section here I want to touch on is that there are common trade-offs to consider. So there's not one size fits all, not one silver bullet in terms of the best way to go remote, whether that's thinking about building your own remote office, using um, uh, an outsourcer to develop the talent, or partnering with a company like Terminal um, to support your team. A lot of things to consider. The first, time versus control. So it's a lot of time to set up your own remote office, but you do get control of that whole experience, that whole relationship, um, and control of that entity. However, that's a big time commitment. Speed versus quality. Much faster to work with an outsourcer who might have a bench of talent ready to go, but you're probably going to take a hit on quality, not in terms of, both in terms of quality of the talent, but potentially the quality of the product, since they're not actually um, electing to join your company and committing their life to that work. And then cost versus convenience. Again, very convenient to have people super close by. Um, that tends to actually have increased costs. So as you are sitting around the table with executives from your company, I find it very important to 
uh, to think about these considerations and talk through what is most important. What are you optimizing for? Um, again, if I, if I go back to the example with HIMS, you know, the billion dollar startup, they optimize for time, how fast could we do this, speed, and cost. Um, and I would look at basically what are going to be the things that you value both now and long term, and that will help set you on the right path for a lot of the further down decision making. Um, so with that, um, if I, I don't see too many questions. I think a, a question was, will the presentation be made available after the meeting? Uh, yes, it will. Um, we will be posting the, the presentation, I think, as will Jeff, um, and we'll make sure that uh, everyone here has it. Um, happy to take any other questions uh, now. Otherwise, I can turn it over um, to Jeff for his section, um, and we can take more questions at the end. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Dylan. Uh, so for those who have joined since the beginning, uh, my name's Jeff Christie. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at uh, Bostap AI. So uh, as you know, when we're talking about hyper growth and massively scaling companies uh, and the benefits of remote teams, um, the emphasis was a bit on setting up in Canada today through di uh, terminals, different options that they have. And so there's a lot of advantages to Canada, uh, and one of them happens to be um, uh, what we call shred or a large tax credit. Uh, a large tax credit. So, hey, Marshall, you said I'm very quiet. Um, maybe I can. Uh, can you hear me better now? You're you're typing, so I'll just pause to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm a little closer to the microphone. So if uh, my uh, volume goes down, just please let me know and we'll keep on working on it. So as we mentioned, uh, one of the advantages of being within uh, Canada uh, are some of the government granting programs and other things that you can get back uh, to help offset uh, some of the costs. A little bit about Boast, um, we've been around since 2011. Um, we help uh, innovative companies in the US and Canada recover money they've spent uh, on R&D. Um, uh, we have a 30 years of experience, and you can see our offices in San Francisco, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, and Calgary as well. A little bit of who we work with. Um, so we service a lot of um, uh, companies that are venture-backed. Uh, we also run a large tech conference in Vancouver every year uh, in conjunction with Launch Academy called Traction. So for those of you guys that don't know, let's go into a quick overview of what this program in Canada is. Um, it stands, it's called SHRED, and it stands for Scientific Research and Experimental Development. Um, it's a $3.4 billion program that allows companies to recoup money they've spent on R&D or advancing technological knowledge. We'll get into that a little bit later on exactly what that means. Um, but first, kind of, you know, how do you claim it and why should, or, or what structure do you need to claim it? So this is kind of a really important slide because there's two types of classifications of companies. So not companies within, are you uh, incorporated, are you a corporation, are you a partnership kind of idea, um, but how are you owned? Um, so you're either going to be considered a Canadian controlled private corporation, so it's exactly what it says. It's controlled from within Canada, it's private, not public, and it's corporation, so it's a corporation or incorporated or you're going to be a non-CCPC. So that would be a Canadian corp that's foreignly owned. Uh, a lot of the times when companies coming out of the U.S. or anywhere else in the world set up in Canada, this might be where they default to their corporate structure, um, where the Canadian entity is wholly owned uh, outside. Now, the primary place that you would want to be is within the CCPC uh, section. And the reason behind that is primarily to do with tax reasons. Um, it's much better tax preferences. Um, and within SHRED, uh, the, this government program, you can get a lot more uh, money that comes back and it comes back in a much more preferable way. So setting up that can be daunting, um, like many things that Terminal talked about. There's lots of different things about going into uh, different markets. Um, so it's one thing the Terminal uh, knows exactly how to do is to make sure that you're structured in a way um, that you're best suited to do business in that country. And that can also include how to best access the SHRED program. So I said I'd get into qualifying criteria because a lot of people will ask right away, well, what type of work is there? Uh, and I think this really uh, ties in nicely into um, what terminal offers and what type of things you're thinking or types of activities you're thinking about building remote teams within Canada. 
So to qualify for the SHRED program, there's three main criteria. And I'll go over these, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into them. So think about these criteria not as uh, business-based, but as technology-based. So this isn't how innovative your business model is in the, uh, in the market, how unique your product is. This is all about the technology that you're building. Uh, and you know how much that is actually pushing the boundaries of what's capable within this. Let's in this case the software development world. So to claim for Shred, you have to meet three criteria: one, that you're seeking a technological advancement; uh, the second, that there's a technological uncertainty on how to get there, meaning that it's just not 100% known either in standard software development or in the public domain; and the third is that you go through an iterative process to try and overcome that. So another way to think about that uh, is by asking yourself five questions to determine here. So these are right off the Canadian Revenue Agency's or the CRA's uh, website. So the first is five questions to determine if you qualify for SHRED. So was there a scientific or technological uncertainty that could not be removed by standard practice or engineering? So it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, what is not knowing? And usually in software development, this isn't 100% of what you're trying to do. There's usually an answer that gets you some of the way there, or part of the way there, but in the entirety of it, you don't know exactly how to get to the finish. Um, you might have some real smart engineers that can hypothesize, but until it's actually built and tested, you don't know if it will work. Uh, a lot of this has to do with different constraints. There might be on funding, time, and other things. Uh, the second one, and you can tell this comes from a government website, um, did you, is the effort involved formulating a hypothesis specifically aimed at reducing or eliminating the uncertainty? All they're looking at here is, was this a methodical investigation? Did we actually go through something? They're not looking for, in, if you're using an agile methodology in your sprints every uh, sprint meetings or scrum meetings to be writing down hypotheses. Um, but they're just looking to see if this was something that was moving forward in a methodical way. Uh, the, again, this big number three. Uh, I won't read it all out, but essentially they're saying, are you going through a process to try and overcome what you're working on uh, and the technical challenges and uncertainties that you've encountered? Um, the four is really interesting. This is the process result in the scientific or technological advancement. Um, advancements can also be failures. So a lot of the times in software development, uh, we can try something and it doesn't work. Uh, and that's just fine because now we know where not to work uh, based on you know the best information out there, we tried something, it didn't work, well now we know how to go and try and build it and test it in another way. Uh, and finally, which is kind of one of the most important things, was a record kept of the hypothesis tested as the work progressed. Again, these are government words. Uh, really what they're looking for is can you prove that you actually did the work? Uh, we're talking using systems like uh, Jira, GitHub, Bitbucket, uh, Microsoft has a suite. Um, there's a lot of tracking tools. We're not talking about writing waterfall methodology type documents throughout the process. We're just talking about making sure that we understand the iterative process that was gone through. So let's dive in a little bit more into this. What we're really talking about here for eligibility um, is back-end development. It's not as much the CRA or the Canadian Revenue Agency says that you are not allowed to claim social sciences. And a lot of social science work they view to be the same as UI or UX type development. Most of this is uh, back-end um, development that's surrounded mainly around the topics of security, scalability, robustness of the system, and different integrations of points that were never meant to be uh, integrated, so integration of disparate systems. As you go through the process of doing this, um, the CRA does want to make sure that you're keeping a record of what's going on. Um, and records don't have to be specifically for SHRED. The way we view uh, record keeping at BOST is if it doesn't have a business uh, outcome, something that works well for your company, you're probably kind of doing it wrong. It shouldn't be documented just for the sake of SHRED. But if you know what you did in a technical development realm, why you did it, and what the outcome was, it really helps you accelerate your future development because you know what's actually happened. So this isn't kind of an esoteric outside of the uh, just document for documentation sake. Um, we're making sure that we're documenting what we're doing for our business sake that happens to also help uh, in claiming back these uh, credits and cash from the government. 
a little bit about technical documentation. Um, the CRA likes to see that the work has been documented at the time it was completed. So this isn't a look back years retrospective. Um, and it highlights exactly what the obstacle you think you're encountering is and how you're going through about it, going through to try and overcome it. Uh, it also needs to be dated. Um, some of the most important things that you need to capture here uh, is the problem and iterations undertaken to attempt to resolve the problem. I'm not talking about a bug fix that's going to take you three hours. Uh, again, these are overarching challenges um, that you're working through over a longer period of time. You want to tr track the different things uh, that you're testing and trying to make uh, and overcome your technological uncertainty. Uh, and what I try and describe to people here is to say, hey, if you forget, if your technical developers wake up tomorrow uh, and they forget the last year, but they're also very, still very talented technical developers, what type of documentation would they want to remind them what they did in the last year, how they encountered it, and how they overcame it? On to a little bit of time tracking. Um, the, the CRA, you're going to claim a portion of uh, the salaries uh, and subcontractor costs that you're incurring within Canada. So they want to see you know, what type of time went into this. Again, we're not talking click on, click off timing during coding time. Um, we're just talking something that could be high level estimated. This could be uh, sprint uh, story points through JIRA, uh, something through Excel that's logged on a weekly or bi-weekly basis on quarterly or half day increments. Um, and like we said, timesheets don't need to be entered daily. When we think about this technical time tracking or technical documentation and time tracking, I want to make it very clear that to submit for shred, this is not a prerequisite to submit. If you've done the work, you've done the work. Uh, if the CRA chooses to review any of your claims, this is when they're going to ask for this type of stuff. So if you're setting up the team initially uh, and the team isn't doesn't have the capacity to do this, um, then yeah, it's not a big deal. Um, but we want to see that you can eventually get to that point. Uh, a, lot, a big thing that we want to point out also, uh, CRA reviews are not packed audits. So they have a specific division that goes through and looks at these claims. Um, the CRA uh, sees that they, or says that they audit 25% of claims a year. At Boast, we see about 13% of our claims getting a closer look through one of these four types of audits. So a little bit more uh, about BOST and how we go through this process. Um, so we've developed a, we have a team of engineers and accountants uh, spread across our four offices. So there's 25 of us all together. Um, and we've also developed a software solution that links into, uh, as you can see here, some of the many financial and technical tracking systems that are uh, on the market. So we find this system and our system works really well because we eliminate the uh, amount of overhead that companies have to put into this. This isn't something that takes multiple hours of your time per week. Uh, it only takes anywhere from uh, one to two hours per quarter to make sure that things are being uh, highlighted properly, recorded properly, and so that we have a good idea on how to advise you how to structure your future work. Um, again, automating the claim are, are people we employ to help you prepare these claims and do all the technical writing and the entire claim preparation are software developers themselves. So they understand. So even though this is a tax credit, really is an engineering uh, project that gets submitted through tax means. So we have a team of engineers that helps you uh, or help, helps you identify the work, uh, and then we take on all the technical writing and financial preparation. So it's something that your technical team can focus back in on all of the development that you need them to do. And finally, we uh, the solution we have helps you maximize the refunds. Um, it's pretty easy to say, oh, we can just identify a small amount of work. But if we're able to see the entirety of the work, when we're able to find work that's specifically shred eligible, we can now claim supporting documentation and supporting work around that. So the work that happened to build up to that point and then go beyond that point. So we're not just looking at a narrow, small side. We're looking at something much larger. A little uh, recap on BOST. Uh, like I said before, we have 30 plus years of in-house experience. Um, we've talked mainly about uh, the SHRED program in Canada today. Uh, the, there is also a program called the U.S. Research and Experimentation uh, Tax Credit Program, which allows companies to recoup large amounts of money they've spent on R&D-based work in the U.S. 
Um, and we help proactively through our software system and our process work on this. So this isn't a retroactive thing, uh, even though it goes through tax means, it's not at an, at an end of day activity. Uh, it's something that we help you with throughout the year. So as you look at uh, uh, the possibility of expanding your, um, your, your team and try and work into kind of the hyper growth area, people are very important and Terminal knows exactly how to uh, find those people, set up what you're looking for. Uh, and they also know the ins and outs of each kind of jurisdiction they work in. And in Canada, one of the advantages, I say one that we've presented to you to here today, uh, is this uh, shred program that uh, allows uh, some recuperation of, of certain costs. So with that, I'll leave you with a nice little testimonial from one of our clients who's um, based in Vancouver and is on a hyper growth trajectory themselves. There's my email and phone number if you guys have any, any further questions or you can type them in the, the bottom. I'll kind of pass it over to Dylan to see if he has anything that he'd like to tie up. Um, if not, that brings us to the end. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Nothing from my end, but really appreciate the, the time and, and working with you guys on, on this content. And for anyone uh, that's interested in working with Terminal, please visit us at terminal.io and um, we will get in touch with you. Great, so we'll stay on here for a couple more minutes uh, for anybody who would like to type any questions or ask anything more. Thank you guys very much for attending.